Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2009 film Dogtooth, and it is a Greek film. This may actually be the very first Greek film I've ever watched. I'm not sure. I've seen plenty of foreign films, but this may be the first Greek one. But this is by Yorgos Lanthimos, and if people don't know Yorgos Lanthimos and how he operates, his movies are always unsettling, or at least from what I've seen, they're unsettling and they're awkward. And one of the reasons they're awkward is apparently he doesn't give a lot of direction to his actors and actually kind of pushes them to do more of kind of like in a, um, you know, non-normal human way of acting. That's one of the biggest things about his films is that the people don't feel like people necessarily. It's very emotionless. It's very cold the way they act, which I think is good because it kind of helps to let you as an audience member look at what's actually going on devoid of any sort of human emotions and looking at them as normal people and actually kind of step back and look at the situation and what's happening from a more objective standpoint because you don't feel invested in the characters, but you feel invested in the story and what's being told and what's trying to be said, basically. So that's why I really love Lanthimos' films, at least the two that I've seen thus far. I've seen Dogtooth, obviously, and I've also seen The Killing of a Sacred Deer, which is phenomenal, and I think better than Dogtooth, which makes sense because it was after Dogtooth, but I do plan on watching the other ones, The Lobster, The Favorite. Um, I'm a fan of this style. The other thing is Lanthimos' films always are looking really good, and he's consistently been working with uh, one cinematographer, I need to call out his name, Themios Bakatakis. This guy does amazing cinematography. He did Dogtooth. He did The Killing of the Sacred Deer. He did The Lobster. He also did The Lodge. So shout out to that guy for just being amazing at cinematography. And between Lanthimos and Bakatagas, just visually very pleasing films. Now it's interesting because I saw The Killing of the Sacred Deer first and then saw Dogtooth. So it's interesting to, to know where... Um, Lanthimos and Bakatakis go after Dogtooth to something that looks even better, something that feels even better, just a bigger film uh, budgetarily and in scope. So just really cool. Anyway, directed by Yorgos Lanthimos, like I said, written by Lanthimos and someone else that he collaborates a lot with for scripts, Ephthemus Philippou, uh, who also worked with him on The Lobster and this Killing of a Sacred Deer scripts. Uh, this film was actually nominated for Best Foreign Language Film at the Academy Awards, so that's a big deal, obviously. And for that reason, it garnered a lot of respect within Greece. It, um, it was very highly lauded as being, you know, this wonderful, you know, patriotic kind of Greek thing. Uh, part of it was actually funded by the Greek Film Center. That's actually something that a lot of countries have is funding that goes to filmmakers from their country. The United States doesn't really do that, which... I mean, I kind of wish they would, but whatever. The film was lauded by the Prime Minister of Greece as a triumph for the whole country and a showing of what can be achieved in a difficult time for the country. Greece has gone through a lot of tough things. Um, so it's interesting that, you know, it's been lauded as this, this wonderful triumph of a film. I understand it from the standpoint of, you know, the critical acclaim that it's gotten and the nominations for awards and everything, but... Did the Prime Minister watch it? Because it's very unsettling. It's it's very weird and gross at a lot of times. And not just, like, from a horror standpoint, but from, like, you know, obviously there's incest in it. And, like, all sorts of messed up stuff. And I want to say swears if I don't have to. Um, but, you know, this film will kind of make you go there in a way. Just because it's so, like, what is going on here? But anyway, let's dig into it. I have a lot to say. The beginning with the cassette tape shows that the parents are trying to teach incorrect words to the kids. I think it's a good way to set it up because it's weird. It makes you wonder, like, what really is going on here? But you understand that the parents, in order to kind of keep their kids isolated, which is really what this all is about, is about and trying to really have the, the utmost amount of control in shaping who they become, who they are, even though, you know, obviously it ends up going wrong. Obviously, spoilers on this, by the way. So um, I think starting with the language situation is a really good way because it, you're you're getting words with wrong definitions and it it's, becomes obvious that it's because they're trying to keep 
certain words out of their vocabulary with the correct definitions so that they don't start questioning things outside of the home. They don't start saying, well, what is this? What is that? And that's the connection to the outside world. That's co connection to a larger society. So if they take those words and they kind of change them to mean their own thing, it keeps not only them physically inside the house, but it keeps them mentally inside the house. It keeps their whole everything inside the house. Everything they learn is within the context of that that family unit. And really, it seems to be mainly just controlled by the father in the film. Or I'll just probably refer to him as his dad in it. But the other thing is, I think it's also important that at that point, there's the, the, old, the younger daughter, and they don't have names in this, the younger daughter, it starts talking about playing the endurance game, which is basically we hold our fingers all under really hot water at the same time, and the last person to pull it out wins. Showing this kind of level of like, it's a little messed up and weird, but this level of like subjecting themselves to pain, a little bit sadistic, a little bit masochistic. And um, I think that's cool to have that in the opening scene as well, because it's a bit of a foreshadowing of what is to come. So it shows the control that's being put on them by the parents. And then it also shows how it's going wrong already because these kids are starting to psychologically be a bit different uh, in, in not a good way. And things, you know, obviously escalate. And I think the script and the film in general does a really good job of kind of escalating things gradually that it feels like it's at a good pace. And the film's about an hour and a half long, so it's not long either. And it feels like a good pace, basically. Uh, the idea for the endurance game seems like the kids are extremely bored, but then you understand that this is kind of like the starting point of where we go. And at the end of my review, I'll kind of give like all the benchmarkers that I really saw of things ratcheting up and getting worse and leading to the big issue where, you know, the dog tooth is knocked out. Um, older, sister, older daughter knocks the dog tooth out of her head or out of her mouth, and then gets in the trunk of the car. And then we don't know what happens after that, but we can, you know, come up with it. But obviously, we then see, not long after that, the situation where the younger daughter is, like, cutting parts of a doll, looks like a Barbie doll, and screaming while she does it. So it's showing that she has this kind of fixation with pain, which is really setting things up and inflicting pain. And that kind of continues. But it happens with the other kids, too. It's just shown in the younger daughter first. Everything seems so mechanical and emotionless in this, even the sex, especially the sex, because I'm assuming what's being what's at play here is that the father's bringing that woman, Christina, from his work in the security guard to just have sex with the son in order to take care of that sexual urge, in order to keep kind of more... Um, aggressive emotions and the testosterone levels down so he doesn't become more aggressive and become more defiant maybe because you know when men get sexually frustrated frustrated it can make it you know they're they're less at ease they're a little bit harder to control and especially if they're young so i think that's kind of the point of it but it was very risky as you end up seeing in the film because things don't go well with christina as she starts you know teaching uh, the older daughter about oral sex and that worms its way in and then the VHS tapes make their way in and then all these things from the outside world that the parents were trying to keep out are there. So I do question the actual move of bringing Christina in. Um, I would think instead that they would kind of talk to him about masturbating most likely. Like that makes more sense than bringing another person in. So I think that's kind of a plot hole in the film. It doesn't feel realistic for the amount of control that the father's actually um, having in the situation. So that, I think, doesn't actually jive. Uh, but obviously there's a lot of control, you know, even with bringing Christina in because they blindfold her, the father blindfolds her when he's driving her there, so they, she doesn't even know where they live. So it's just this in and out type thing. But then also when she's there, no one's keeping an eye on her. The mom, that's another thing, like the mom's almost never around. Like she's always at the house is what's insinuated, but she's never actually around. So that's just another layer of issue of where things start to go wrong because like the father wants all this control, but then the mother is just like kind of aloof in a sense. It seems like maybe she's in her bedroom most of the time talking on the phone and doing other stuff that the, the kids aren't supposed to know about. I don't know. 
So the next level of control is revealed with the stickers and that reward system that they have and their video entertainment, which basically aren't even films. It's just home videos. And that ends up having a role later on to kind of mess with the perception of reality with those kids and cause even more problems. Because when they're watching these videos, they think that's entertainment. That's what film is, basically. But it's real life. So when eventually the older daughter sees Jaws and Rocky, she thinks that is probably real life as well. And that's why she starts to kind of emulate it and think, oh, this is okay because everything we see on film is real life and we can emulate that because we've done that before. So that kind of shows the level of how bad of an idea it really is to be exerting this amount of control over these kids. So yeah, pretty bad. Even though these actors, like, they definitely don't seem like kids, but you know, what are you going to do? For this type of content, you can't actually get kids. Terrible. Um, so this really shows that their motivations in life and and um, the, even the entertainment they take in, it's all manufactured by their parents. Everything in their life is manufactured by their parents, and that's that extreme control. Uh, the anesthetic huffing game is very, very messed up. That's one of those next level things that kind of like moves the danger forward a little bit more it's another foreshadowing but it shows kind of how warped the kids are becoming because of their isolation um it just it's just that next indicator when the father goes to get his dog or to ask for his dog to to be taken um back it, and they say that the dog's only on like the second level of training and he needs to go through five this is the moment where they're kind of showing this parallel. They talk about the dogs being molded like clay. And that's exactly what's going on with the kids at that point with the father. Um, and it's a statement. I don't know if this is or is not, but I wrote down the question of, is this a statement on the cruelty of training animals to be who we want them to be by showing us the same thing from an actual human perspective? So I'm wondering if maybe Lanthimos's, um kind of idea with this film was to be like, let's take dog training and kind of show it to an audience, to a human audience in a way that it's being done with humans and giving them the idea that, the, isn't this a bad idea? Isn't this messed up? All the, you know, you're depriving these animals of their nature. You're depriving these animals of who they really would end up being. And I think that's interesting to kind of look at and, and dive into. And, um, I feel like that could really be a point of this film. The first moment of defiance we end up seeing is the older sister when she, when she takes those two pieces of cake. Now, I don't know why, but she, she throws one of them over the fence. That's never really explained. Maybe that's what bring the cat, brings the cat to their yard. And maybe, I don't know, she was trying to see if it brings anything. I don't know. But the other one she pockets, so I assume she's going to eat that later. But this is the very first moment of defiance against the parents that you see. And it's just one in many, and it's, you know, yet again, another moment of foreshadowing to show you that defiance is happening. And it is mainly the older sister who really goes with uh, or, or initiates the defiance and, and sticks to it most. Christina's role in the family starts to turn when she tries to introduce oral sex which the parents obviously would not want because that's very improper. They're trying to keep things very proper according to, you know, their messed up morals. The kids think a salt shaker is a phone, yet the mother actually talks on a phone in her room, um, but the kids think that she's just talking to herself. That's one of, those int one of those things where they're actually showing the implementation of those alternative definitions that were introduced in the beginning of the film actually being used when, you know, they say phone for a salt shaker when they're at the dinner table and then later they're like oh mom's talking to herself again and then you see the mom is actually using a phone giving you the idea that the kids don't even know the concept of what a phone is or how it would work and you kind of see that later when the older sister goes in and actually finds or i guess already knows about the phone pulls it out and starts to try to use it and then kind of puts it away another showing of defiance obviously it's a funny scene uh, when the dad goes and gets the airplane for the brother. The one that, I forget, I think it was the younger sister maybe? Or no, maybe the older sister who throws it through the through the fence. And then the father needs to go get it. It's just funny because the, the son is just standing there. He could just like go those few feet, but he's not allowed to. And he knows that. So the father like goes out in the car and then like opens the door and grabs it and goes back in. 
which is important because the father also says, you know, when we end up going anywhere, you have to be inside the car. That's how you're protected. That's how you're safe. So when you, you can uh, leave the house when you lose your dog tooth, and then you can learn to drive the car when you grow a new dog tooth, and that's right side or left side, which obviously is the title of the film, so it's very important. The scene of the brother killing the cat seems like it's supposed to further draw that parallel between these kids and dogs because of that, you know, age-old idea of, you know, dogs will try and kill cats and that rivalry between them. Um, also, that's a awful scene for a lot of people, including myself, just because, you know, I have a cat. I love cats. I'm, you know, around my house. I am cat dad. Uh, and so, yeah, it's hard to see that stuff. And it looked real with the cat's dead body, but apparently I did some research. And apparently at the end of the film, there is a disclaimer saying that no animals were hurt in the making of the film. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Uh, I do stay away from, you know, animal cruelty, stuff like that. That's why I've intentionally never watched Cannibal Holocaust and never will. Although I am told there is a sanitized version of it, which maybe I would check that out. I don't know. But I've also heard the film's not actually that good. So It does go too far in having the kids on all fours barking because that's kind of way too on the nose where they draw that parallel once again with the, the dogs and the kids with the cat. Like, that's fine. It's a little more subtext. But then they're on all fours barking and everything. I feel like they should have not done that because that's just taking it too far. That's kind of beating the audience over the head and saying, did you get what we're trying to do here? No, keep it more subtext. I like it better that way. Be subtle. Don't insult your audience because that's kind of how I view that. Wouldn't the qu kids question the idea of the mother giving birth to a dog? Because they do that whole thing where they're like, your mother's pregnant with twins. And then they use it as kind of like a scare tactic to be like, you guys need to get your behavior in line. Otherwise, she's going to have these kids and you're going to have to share your rooms. And they're like, no, no, no. But then they also say she's also going to give birth to a dog. Why? Like, I do feel like they would probably question that because they do know that everyone in the family is a human being. So I think there would be questions related to that. So I think that's yet another kind of small but bit of a plot hole in the script. So, yeah. The dance dancing scene is unbelievably awkward. Actually, there's two dancing scenes, and they're both very, very awkward. Just yet another kind of Yorgos Lanthimos type thing of humans being very awkward. Uh, but it's funny. Like, I found those dancing scenes funny. You see how impressionable the kids are when the older one watches Christina's movies and starts reenacting Rocky and Jaws, like I talked about. This indicates a big problem that's coming as the only movies the kids have ever seen have been real life. So most likely they, that older one who saw it actually believes that it is real life. And then you see her reenacting things. And it is disturbing to the degree that she reenacts stuff. Not so much the Jaws portion because that seems a little more just like funny and fun. But the Rocky one where she's like trying, she's like making the motions of like punching herself and like being in pain and like spitting fake blood and stuff like that. And I think that's kind of what moves her a little bit closer to being fine with the idea of knocking her dog tooth out. Um, that kind of like plants the seed a little bit. The dad ends up trying to tie that VHS, the VHS tapes that he finds um, to the idea of pain and punishment with the older daughter when he finds out what was going on. And he does that obviously by taping the, the VHS tape to his hand and beating her with it. That's something that's done with animals a lot of the time. And you actually see it um, earlier on when the dog's being trained when he's biting and they're like hitting the dog with a stick, which I hope they weren't actually hitting the dog with the stick. I guess the disclaimer would say they didn't. But once again, you never really know what was going on with these. But I found that interesting because that yet is another like animal training type thing, which is like, you know, the response of you did that, boom, pain. Don't do that. It's, it's the... Um, the programming, basically. The dad's idea to replace Christina with one of the daughters shows an unbelievably sick level that he's really willing to go to to maintain control. It shows how obsessed he is to a very messed up degree about maintaining this control. Um, like I said, it would make a lot more sense if in the script, like he would, the, the kid, was, kid would just be masturbating. I do 
feel like this was very unnecessary, that this was just kind of done to be more unsettling. I don't necessarily have a problem with it being in the film, but I also feel like it wasn't needed. It's just another degree of sick, which I guess they were just going for, maybe? I don't know. The scene of the older daughter knocking out the dog tooth is brutal. Yeah, the way they shot that, it looks real, it looks brutal. The way they were able to, you know, when she's swinging it, the, the blood splattering on the on the um mirror it looked very real and it, it was very impactful it's a very ambiguous ending but i would assume that the older daughter ends up dying in the trunk because how would she even know how to get out of it first of all can she get out of it because i don't know if that's one of those cars that has like an in, inside release lever second of all she probably wouldn't even know if that exists and yeah the father obviously doesn't know that she's there so I assume my assumption is where things go from there is she dies in the trunk of that car. So her actually leaving the house leads to her death because she wasn't set up with any sort of um, tools or thinking in order to survive outside of the house. So, and, and it's interesting though, because she goes to the car because she's been conditioned to know that that's, if she's going to leave the house, that's how she's still protected but she needs to do it without being discovered by the parents. So that's all she knows how to do. So in her mind, she's safe, but in the end, she's not actually safe because she hasn't been taught about the dangers of getting stuck in the trunk of the car. So that ends up being her demise, basically. So she's kind of in an extension of the house, so still in that world, but leaving it at the same time. But I'm assuming that leads to her demise. Silence is used in this film quite a bit, and I think it's really done well because it helps with letting you feel awkwardness in the film, which there's plenty of, and the tension, which there's also plenty of. I love when directors use silence well, and it, that's done here. Uh, very interesting cinematography, like I talked about. Uh, all these sh They have all these shots with multiple layers in them where it'll be like something that you can focus on close up and then something further. And there are ones as well that are kind of like three layers in a way, like the fence scene. The first one where you see the, the, the son talking to the fence, and it's kind of like him, the fence, and then like the mountains in the background, which look really interesting. So they did a lot of like cool layered shots like that, which just look great and are really, really nice. There's a lot of attention to detail in the script because of how many aspects of control end up being shown by the parents. Um... So I, I wrote down a lot of the key ones, and here they are, just kind of listing them off. The alternate word definitions, the reward system, the blindfolding for transportation and use of the car, video entertainment that's just the home videos, cutting the water bottle labels off, because they show that at one point, using toy airplanes to disguise the existence of actual airplanes, because at the one point where they're just like, look, a plane fell out of the sky. Because you can't tell when they're far away, the kids can't, that they're actually much larger. So that's how they disguise that. Using pregnancy as a threat to the kids to scare them into their behavior. Deciding to turn incest, turn to incest for the son's sexual needs. Like all those levels of control, all that. It, they didn't need to show that much, but they, they went to, you know, it was very painstaking in the script to kind of make it feel very controlled. And then uh, here are the, the main um, kind of steps that I, that I identified for things getting out of control. First, the endurance game of, you know, the finger under the hot water. Then the doll cutting with the screaming. Then the anesthetic huffing game. Then the older sister cutting the brother with the knife on his arm. Then the son killing the cat. Then the older daughter reenacting movies. Then the younger daughter hitting the son with a hammer. And then the older da daughter finally knocking out her dog tooth and leaving. Those are kind of like the main points where things really escalate. And the last thing I had to say is Lanthimos films seem to be awkward in a way that lets you see people and humanity in a more objective way. With no emotion to relate to, you can look at everyone as kind of an alien being and really just see the situation and focus on that story. Now, that said, it doesn't always work when people try and do something kind of like that, but I just feel like the way Lanthimos pulls it off, it does work. And maybe some people feel differently about that, but that's just, you know, my opinion on it. 
So out of five stars with half stars in play, where am I going to put this one? I'm going to put it at a pretty solid four star rating. I think it is a really good film. Uh, probably pretty tough for a good amount of people for many reasons. You know, the animal potential animal cruelty thing, uh, the incest, uh, the brutality of some of the stuff, the the just like crazy control that the family has. So yeah, it's messed up and it's weird, but that's Lanthimos. So I'm even more excited now to eventually check out The Lobster and The Favorite, which I know The Favorite is not like the other films. I think The Lobster isn't as much either, but is kind of from what I've heard. But anyway, uh, put some comments down here. We'll talk about this film. Uh, do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe button because it means a lot to me and the growth of my channel. And it literally takes you a second. So, you know, no big deal for you guys, but it is a big deal for me. So I would appreciate that if you like any videos I do. Um, and if you are going to do that, make sure you also hit the notification bell. That way, you know, anytime I'm putting up new reviews or doing live streams or any of that stuff. But regardless, thanks for taking the time to check this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.